Uh, now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Matthew Garrett, who's going to talk about building a secure desktop with known technologies. Good morning. Uh, so my name is Matthew Garrett. I have been involved in the GNOME community in various ways since I think going back to 2003. So it's always a pleasure being at Guadec and having the opportunity to talk to such a wonderful community of committed people from all sorts of areas of interest. I started off working on accessibility software in GNOME, which is really where my contributions to free software turned into actual uh, externalized things. Uh, these days, I've sort of diverged, and I primarily work on security at Google. So I'm part of what we call the client platform hardening team, which is a set of people responsible for securing operating systems that are used internally on client systems. So I'm not going to be talking about anything that we produce as a product. I'm not going to be talking about anything that we deploy in production. And for the most part, I'm not even going to be talking about anything that we deploy at all, because I'm not really allowed to. But for context, we have literally tens of thousands of developers inside Google using desktop Linux. And obviously, we have to care a great deal about the security of our systems, not just for the protection of the source code that we don't release, but also because we are responsible for a large quantity of user data. And ensuring that that is secure, ensuring that users who have provided data to us do not end up having that data leaked is very, very, very important. And so the work that I'm doing and that other people are doing inside the company is focused at reducing the risks associated with running desktop Linux. And that's a large part of what I'm going to be talking about today. It turns out that security is difficult. Uh, one of the first things we did when we started writing software was to write it in C, and that probably turns out to have been a terrible, terrible mistake. C makes it very, very easy to get things wrong, and when you get things wrong in C, the worst case outcome is very, very worst case. Parsers are also bad. It turns out to be very difficult to write code that catches all the corner cases. How many of you were in Federico's presentation yesterday? Yeah. So um, writing parsers in C turns out to be, like, if you take the difficulty involved in writing parsers correctly, and you take the difficulty involved in writing C correctly, and then you multiply the two of those together, and then that's still not as bad as it turns out to be in most cases. Uh, parsers that are written in C tend to be pretty reliable mechanisms for executing arbitrary code in arbitrary places, which, from a security perspective, is bad. And then even if we assume that software does end up correctly embodying the intent of the developer, if we assume that parsers have been written that are able to handle all malformed input in a graceful way, we're still making the assumption that when we designed something in the first place, it was designed correctly, that there aren't fundamental logic errors that result in security being compromised. For the most part, we are well beyond the point where any human can understand the complexity of the systems that we have built, which is alarming and makes it somewhat difficult for us to, with confidence, say that anything we produce is secure. Obviously, thankfully, a lot of the time when we discover security vulnerabilities, when we discover cases where we have made a mistake in C again, or where we have found another parser that does not actually behave in a way that we would like it to. It's found by us rather than being found by bad people. And even when it is found by bad people, we often find out what that vulnerability is quite quickly. And then we produce updates, we fix it, we push that out to people, 
and then, well, we're more secure. Unfortunately, updates aren't really sufficient. You have the fundamental problem that users dislike updates. An update is something that potentially takes a working system and turns it into a system that no longer works. And users don't like that. You can't make users update. Even users, okay, quick poll. How many of you are running a distribution which pops up notifications telling you that there are updates available? How many, okay, so that was almost everybody. Put your hand up if you immediately install those updates, including rebooting your computer, if required. Okay, a much smaller number. <laughs> like maybe 10% the number. You are, of GNOME's users, among the most technically aware, the most technically astute, the ones who perhaps best understand the risks associated with running out-of-date software, and you aren't installing them. <laughs> so what hope is there? Users won't do this. You can't make them, it's not going to happen, if our security story relies on users reliably installing updates in a timely manner, we're doomed. It's not going to work. And also, attackers aren't usually polite enough to wait for everybody to have updated a system before attacking them. One of the problems that everybody faces is that a patch that fixes a security vulnerability inherently contains information about what that vulnerability was. In the proprietary world, that's a case where someone then has to reverse engineer the thing. We're somewhat more polite, and unless you're the Linux kernel, the patches that fix security vulnerabilities will tend to loudly announce that they fix security vulnerabilities, which makes it even easier for attackers to find the vulnerability. So we have to deal with the case that the moment the patch hits public awareness, attackers will be able to make use of that knowledge. And as we've already established, users aren't going to install updates in a timely manner, and so there's going to be a window during which attackers can continue to attack the system, even if we have fixed the vulnerability. Which means that mitigation matters. We can't say the only way to deal with security issues is to patch every vulnerability we find and then immediately assume that users are running the patched version. That's not possible. Instead, we have to accept that there will be insecure software running on people's systems, and we have to deal with that. So in this sort of context, when I talk about mitigation, what I mean is any technology that allows us to reduce the impact of a security vulnerability, ideally in a way that makes it impossible for a vulnerability in one component to impact either the code or the data held in other components of the system. For instance, if there's a vulnerability in a PDF viewer, it's desirable for that to be limited such that the only thing that can be exploiting that vulnerability gives you nothing other than the ability to read PDFs, ideally. Or, you know, possibly you're able to turn the PDF viewer into something that can actually also launch denial of service attacks, but if the PDF viewer does not have any network access, that doesn't matter. So, mitigation is the process of finding ways to cause vulnerabilities to be irrelevant or to be so harmless that it doesn't matter that much if users are going to update in a timely manner. So some amount of uh, these mitigations can take the form of technological improvements, cases where we aren't necessarily getting to the point of finding a vulnerability and fixing it. Instead, that happens much earlier in the process. Static analysis, like Coverity, is a big part of this. Uh, being able to identify cases where code has just been written incorrectly in the first place. Uh, again, if we weren't writing in C, this would be much less of a problem. Uh, 
improvements in compilers such that we're able to, again, identify some vulnerabilities, but also such that we're able to do things like uh, use code flow integrity technology such that various attack mechanisms are mitigated. Uh, so there's a way, as we got into the point where you're no longer able to just write new code into data in a program and then execute that data due to improvements in CPU technology, attackers started using something called return-oriented programming where you don't write new code yourself. Instead, you just get the code to jump to some code that does what you want it to do. There are improvements, various bits of research, various compilers in various parts of the world that are now able to protect against that. You get to the end of a function that you've jumped into and it makes sure that it's jumping back to somewhere it should have come from. So compiler improvement can deal with a lot of vulnerabilities as well. Even if there is a vulnerability, improvements in compiler technology can avoid them being exploitable. And using safer languages. If we were writing in Rust rather than C, the world would be a better place from a security perspective. Obviously, when we talk about security in general, we think about people hacking into systems remotely. The easiest way to deal with this on desktops is to just not have any exposed network services. That's the problem completely solved. And for the most part, we have that. There's obviously stuff like uh, an MDNS responder that may be there on a large number of systems. But keeping that amount of code small, keeping it auditable, and not changing it a great deal is pretty much sufficient. We don't have to worry a great deal about people compromising desktop Linux systems by hacking into them remotely. Anyone else hear that? OK, not just me. That's good. So what do users care about? And obviously, we've established already that users, including you, don't care about updates. But they do care about their personal data. If a system is compromised and their data is stolen, that's kind of bad. If a system is compromised and their data is deleted, that's probably even worse. But more importantly, they care that their computer continues working. If you are sitting there and you have a deadline for an essay, and you discover that someone has just managed to get hold of everything you've downloaded in the past three months, that's probably still less important to you than getting this essay finished on time. And so anything that makes it more difficult for people to use their computers in the way they would like to use them is a security, techno is a security technology that is not likely to be accepted by users. Security that gets in the way of what people are doing is security that gets turned off. Uh, we've seen that with SE Linux. We've seen that with complex password rules. Any time you inconvenience a user beyond a certain level, it doesn't matter how much additional security you're adding, they will just disable or work around that security technology. And they will gladly, it turns out, sacrifice the security of their personal data in order to keep their computer working, in some cases. So we need to start thinking about security very strongly in the sense of how do we build a desktop operating system where security is invisible, where security does not get in the way of what people are doing, and where security still provides meaningful benefit, where security does result in user data being under the user's control and not arbitrarily accessible to pretty much anybody with an email client. And at the moment, we're not really there. Uh, there's, in most cases, if a single application on a desktop Linux system is compromised, you have access to the user's entire uh, session. You have the ability to do pretty much anything that the user is able to do. And there's been some work on this. SE Linux does support being used in a, uh, Fedora does ship with an SE Linux policy that restricts 
what certain applications can do to a certain extent, but it's very difficult to say, for instance, that events can only read files in the user's home directory because the user will try to read, for instance, PDFs in various other locations. Uh, Ubuntu ships with various app armor policies for various applications that, again, try to restrict what they can do to a certain extent. But right now, the situation is still pretty much that if a single application is compromised, that's equivalent to the entire desktop session being compromised. So we're not really in a very good place. Now, as you've heard, we've been talking about Flatpak a lot this week. Uh, Flatpak is, it's very now. Uh, the set of buzzwords that Flatpak embodies is the correct set of buzzwords. <laughs> so Flatpak uses kernel namespaces. Flatpak uses kernel C groups. It uses various bits of kernel technology that allow you to isolate a process's view of the system, such that it may think that it's running on the bare system, but it's actually contained with a limited perspective of what's available to it. And one of the really nice features here is the ability to use something called, uh, technologies called portals. The appli contained application has very little access to the rest of the system. So, for instance, if you run events again, it's not able to see the other files in the user's home directory. The user's home directory has not been made available to the application. If you attempt to open the file directly, it won't work because those files literally are not there from the application's perspective. So portals allow you to provide gated access to resources that's not otherwise accessible. An example of this is the ability to open a file. So uh, if you open a file, or if you go to file open, we can then create a dialog out of process in the actual parent session, choose a file there, and then pass the file descriptor back into the contained environment, which is wonderful. The only way that even in that scenario is able to open the file is due to explicit interaction by the user. There's no programmatic way of doing that. So wonderful. We can, with technology, end up in a situation where the application behaves as the user expects it to, but the application only has access to files and resources that the user explicitly wanted it to have access to. And in the event of a malformed PDF being used to compromise events to get arbitrary code execution within it, that doesn't matter. There's still no way for it to access the other files that the user owns. There's no way it can obtain user passwords. So, wonderful. This solves a lot of these problems. Our Flatpak is pretty much aimed at desktop applications. You're running stuff under a desktop session. It's using various bits of desktop technology. One of the other nice things that we're able to do with Flatpak and indeed other technologies is also use a kernel feature called SecComp, which allows you to filter various system calls. You can say that this application is only permitted to make a certain number of system calls. And that's important not so much in terms of improving the security of the application, but that means that if the application is compromised, the attack surface against the kernel is reduced. The kernel is very large, and the kernel is written in C. So we can pretty much assume that the kernel is probably terrible. Experience has mostly borne this out. Restricting the system calls that are available to an application allows you to reduce the amount of the kernel that is exposed to those applications, which in turn makes it possible to avoid a lot of kernel vulnerabilities. So that's also an important part of this. In the opposite side, we have Snap, which is canonical solution. Uh, it's rather than being sort of container-based, it uses Linux security modules. Right now, the implementation is quite tightly tied to AppArmor. Uh, 
there is ongoing work to attempt to design a mechanism to uh, use SE Linux for this. Problem is, SE Linux policies vary quite widely. It's quite difficult to assert that a specific piece of SE Linux policy will exist on any given operating system that uses SE Linux. And yeah, I think this is going to be difficult to get right. It's not impossible, but it's going to be difficult. And that may restrict the extent to which Snap is viable as a cross-platform technology. But it does have some other benefits. And the chief one is that it's a much more general purpose software distribution mechanism. It's not tied to graphical applications in the same sort of way that Flatpak is. And as a result, you're able to do things like use, uh, you can ship, for instance, TCP dump as a snap. And then when run, that will run in an isolated environment even though it's a console application. TCP dump, relevant because uh, it's pulling stuff off the network. You can't trust stuff that's on the network. It's having to do some parsing of stuff that's there. So it's the sort of thing that you would like to be isolated because it is dealing with untrusted input. So right now, I think it's difficult to say that either of Snap or Flatpak is absolutely the correct choice uh, or is absolutely going to be the most viable option. But I think the adoption of this kind of technology is a vital part of actually getting us to reasonably secure desktops. Unfortunately, this is all rendered pretty pointless because X is not only written in C and large and terrible and bad and terrible and <laughs> bad. X also has, well, to be fair, we're not great at writing C now, but we've got a lot better based on the things we've learned in the past 30 years. Uh, X was originally written in 1985 when we did not have as much practice at this. And so it suffers from having an old code base that is not particularly accessible to new developers and is also uh, riddled with what we would probably these days call terrible programming practices. But you know, it's, it's a product of its time. But the problem with X is not really just that the code itself is kind of scary. The problem is that X doesn't have a good concept of process isolation. If you have a connection to the X server, you can inject keyboard events, input events into the X server, you can scrape the contents of other applications. You're in a position to uh, basically control a user's system. So thankfully, Wayland will fix all of this for us. Hooray. <laughs> but there are still cases where we have various dependencies on X, even if a user is running a Wayland session and is running entirely GNOME applications, we still have some dependencies on X, which is unfortunate. Uh, getting rid of those, getting to a point where we can have a pure Wayland session is important from the perspective of actually having full isolation within a system. And obviously, we need to deal with NVIDIA. But this isn't the full story. When we talk about what's running on a desktop, we are not able to just think about the apps. There's more code running than just the apps. And unfortunately, in some cases, these other bits of code are also parsing things. And as we've previously established, code that parses things is probably code you should be afraid of. So when it comes to thumbnailing, it's wonderful. Let's have a single application that is expected to be able to parse basically everything. And then let's make it possible for people to add additional parsers to it. What could possibly go wrong? Oh, and then for bonus points, let's automatically run this against basically everything that ends up in the user's home directory. It's all literally OK. Nothing could go wrong here at all. 
Uh, so there's basically no reason for any of this stuff to happen in the actual session. Instead, we can just have the actual thumbnailing happen somewhere else. And the actual thumbnailing does not itself need access to any of the user's information or data. So the obvious thing for us to do in, say, the thumbnailing case would be for the thumbnailer to fork the code that actually does the thumbnailing and then have that run in a confined environment where it has no access to anything except the file that it's supposed to be thumbnailing. That would be a brilliant future. And it's the one we live in today, which is Perfect. Uh, so thanks, Bastian. Is he here? <laughs> so Bastian was kind enough to force me to modify my slide deck after I'd gone to the effort of getting my slide deck approved by our corporate PR people by providing a 500-line patch to the thumbnailer that runs the actual thumbnailing code under bubble wrap and grants no access to a user's actual data. At the moment, there's quite a lot of code there that's basically boilerplate, some of which has actually been extracted from Flatpak. It would be very nice to have this be a, a very convenient set of functions that were available at the infrastructure level and which other applications could make use of as well. Uh, so obviously, as well as Thumbnailer, we also have Tracker, which is doing similar kinds of open every file and parse it. And there are cases where, uh, for the most part, most people don't have to deal with this, but there are people who, for various reasons, end up having to run antivirus software on Linux. And having those things automatically open uh, files that are downloaded and parse them. Turns out that a lot of the time that gives you arbitrary code execution in the anti-malware checker. Uh, because again, these things are written in C and doing lots of parsing. Certain amounts of irony there. Having the infrastructure to easily do everything in a sandbox environment would be a benefit for everybody. So uh, I would love to see that. But this is, I'm going to get a little controversial here. This is all broadly irrelevant because many users don't run apps other than a browser and don't download files because they just do everything in the browser. There are teams at Mozilla and Google and Microsoft who are devoted to improving the security of browsers, to improving the security of the internet, effectively, by making browsers better, but also by providing infrastructure to warn users that, for instance, sites they're going to are known to be dangerous. Epiphany doesn't, as far as I can tell, have any support for using the Safe Browsing API, which is not completely unreasonable given that it's an API provided as proprietary infrastructure. But that means that if a user who would, if a user were running Firefox or Chrome and clicked on a link, then they may get a warning telling them that the page they're trying to get to is known to contain malware and they may want to be careful. If they do the same in Epiphany, they'll just go to the page. There's a question of whether, in some cases, we are actually serving our users well by trying to do things that are much more difficult than we have the resources to manage. And I think it's legitimate to start thinking about whether, for certain components we ship, whether continuing to press for those rather than improving uh, the integration of better supported browsers is the right thing to be doing. I think if we are going to be user-focused rather than just focusing on the desktop being what we would like the desktop to be, we may need to revisit some of these choices. So 
as I mentioned, the kernel is not particularly trustworthy. Setcomp is viable to reduce the attack surface of the kernel to a certain extent, but there's still a lot of kernel code that's visible. And one option here is rather than just running applications in a contained environment, is basically booting a miniature virtual machine that does nothing other than host that application. If it compromises the kernel inside that VM, it doesn't matter. It's not the same kernel. You've still got the hypervisor boundary between the compromised system and the user's actual data. So this is something that may make sense for certain high-risk applications. But there are a lot of difficult issues around that. The biggest one being uh, physio acceleration, but also other stuff. Like, uh, it's not very easy to modify the resources that are allocated to a VM at runtime. If a process inside the VM wants more memory than is available inside the VM, you need to jump through a lot of hoops to make more memory available to the VM. And communication between the application that's running in the VM and the rest of the system is kind of a pain. Uh, IPC is obviously not really happening because it's no longer a process in the same sense. But we're also missing certain kinds of infrastructural best practices, stuff that we could do and haven't done. One of the biggest problems I see facing the free desktop is that we don't have a comprehensive free software cross-platform password manager story. We don't have something that integrates with the browser and with apps on not only GNOME, but also apps on other platforms such as Android. And this is a problem that we often sort of ignore. Passwords are not things that are tied to your desktop. Passwords are things that are tied to your account somewhere else. And having a password manager that only works on a given desktop is unhelpful because then if I need to log into the same account on my phone, I don't have access to those secrets. Now, having a solution there would be great because right now we don't and it kind of sucks. Having more of our security be backed by hardware would also be nice. Uh, almost every system that ships today has something called a trusted platform module, which is a small hardware security device embedded on the motherboard, which will encrypt things and hold secrets and only release those secrets if the system's in a valid state. So this can be used to make it pretty much impossible to crack people's passwords offline. You can encrypt them with the TPM, and then if they don't have access to that specific TPM, there's no way to decrypt them. Obviously, that, in that strict sense, is a kind of unfortunate recovery uh, story. If your machine breaks, then you lose all your secrets, which is suboptimal. So yeah, coming up with some sort of good story there about when it's appropriate to use hardware backed stuff and how to balance security and ease of recovery. Again, I think something that we need to be looking at more strongly. The more users, OK, I've been talking about mitigation, but there are still going to be security vulnerabilities that we're not able to protect against using mitigation techniques. There are occasionally going to be bugs in infrastructural components that need to be updated in order for users to be protected. Having frictionless updates and upgrades that users can trust, that users believe will not break their system, is still a vital part of the security story. And we need to be better at producing upgrades that work reliably, that users can legitimately trust to work correctly. I think a big part of that is going to be uh, the, well, one of the problems we have right now with the distribution model is that each distribution is responsible for its own updates. And 
you have several different people independently testing slightly different code. With luck, as we move to more components being shipped centrally, we can get away from that. We can have more resources allocated to testing in a coherent, cooperative way, and we can improve the quality of our updates and users can have more confidence that updates will actually not break their system. So the situation this year is already much better than it was last year. It's already possible for distributions to start using containerized applications and for users to be better protected as a result. But we're still not far enough. We are still making decisions that are not necessarily in the best interest of user security and privacy. There is still infrastructural work that we have not done that is going to make it easier for this security to be integrated into other parts of the platform. And there are some cases where we really need to make decisions about what the correct thing to do for users is. So we have a few minutes left for questions. Uh, anyone have anything they'd like to ask? Low battery on this, but uh, I shall change it after the questions. Um, you uh, uh, at the beginning uh, mentioned um, uh, static analysis tools. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, the best ones uh, are pretty expensive. Uh, Coverity is, is yep. the reference. I think there are some solutions. Um, I think it's Sonar, the, the name, that uh, offer a, a free uh, open source license to, do, to, to work with many, many languages, or with, with some. Um, what alternatives do you know, or what practices do you recommend on, on this part of the static analysis thing? Because as far as I know, there are spectacular results in some cases. That's not really my area of expertise, unfortunately. Uh, so I think I'm, uh, I think Philip has something to say here. <laughs> um, Coverity is free to use for open source projects, but the product is still proprietary. So if you have an open source project and you can prove that it's under an open source license, you can submit it to Coverity and get the results. And you can do that as much as you like. Um, there are other static analysis tools available like Clang Analyzer, they have their own benefits and uh, downsides. Um, generally, Coverity is probably the first thing to turn to because it's probably the best. But you can integrate Coverity in your uh, system integration, in your computer integration? Yes. Um, we should do that more. Okay, the, um, statement there was that it's possible to integrate Coverity into continuous integration. Hi. Um, so I used to work for a company that did virtualization of browsers, PDF readers, mm -hmm. and things like that. And uh, the point was that sandboxing is, can be a bit shit because there are uh, lots of vulnerabilities that are not that difficult to, yep. to find. But even with vit virtualization, you have a huge surface, uh, surface of attack because you still need to have a lot of communication with, right. with the host, uh, for instance, to set the title of a window you need to send this string. Um, and this can break in very bad ways. Yeah. For instance, a Google uh, researcher found a bug in uh, the Windows product that my company uh, worked on, and basically Internet Explorer, if you have a URL, let's say it's resource column stuff, something and a DLL, it will just load the DLL. Mm -hmm. So we had this virtual machine. It just saw a URL that couldn't handle because it was not HTTP, HTTPS. Pass it to the host where Internet Explorer would just load that DLL. Yeah. Um, that was particularly stupid. But then the problem is that whatever we do, we are going to still have a pretty big surface of attack, which is right. worrying. All and of these solution. techniques don't avoid the need to write secure code in the first place. And the worst case scenario is certainly that in some cases, while things like containerization or virtualization reduce the amount of attack surface that a specific application has access to, 
you're still increasing the amount of code running on the system. And with more code comes more responsibilities. Uh, sorry, more vulnerabilities. <laughs> so, yeah, none of these are magic uh, solutions. Um, we do need to be cognizant of what the threat model is, what the correct way to minimize the attack surface is in any given case. Yeah, um, it's more like a comment um, that the Cubes OS project is also trying to um, have GNOME as UI, and mm -hmm. if people want to involve there, I think they would be quite happy about that. Yeah, so Cubes is an interesting approach, uh, but the problem is using Cubes effectively means that you need to mentally compartmentalize what you're doing into either work or non-work contexts. And training users to behave differently can be quite difficult. A naive user is unlikely to get this right all the time. And even one mistake potentially means that someone has access to your work context from your user context. So it, if you are the sort of person who will behave correctly, Cubes is wonderful. It is a definite improvement in security. I think Cubes is probably not generalizable for many types of user, but it's certainly not invisible in the way that we would like security to be. So um, now that Flatpak can deal with the QEMU system hooks for bin format, so we can actually run like ARM code in a Flatpak runtime on x86, uh, do you, have you in investigated at all whether or not in the VM case we should just run QEMU system x86-64 on a x86-64 and use that for the VM hooks? I, so I think it would need to be a little more complicated than that. Uh, if you want to run well, QEMU system, you're still going to need to boot a kernel. You're still going to need some sort of IPC. Personally, I wouldn't recommend QEMU for this. QEMU was not originally written to deal with untrusted guest code. And there's been a lot of work in improving the security of QMU, but there have also been multiple vulnerabilities. QMU implements a lot more than you actually need in this case. Uh, it's emulating an entire PC when all you actually want is to provide basically virtualized resources. So I think something like KVM tool would probably be a better choice rather than QMU. OK, one more question, I think. Um. Is that a hand up? Hmm? Is that a hand up or not? So, no, I was asking if you were asking a question. Yeah, I'm asking. Right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, now that the thumbnailers are sandboxed, do you have a general sense of what would give us the most bang for the buck? Like, uh, there was discussion before about should we sandbox the individual PixBuff loaders? Should we concentrate on rewriting them in Rust, of course? <laughs> should we, or I mean, do we concentrate on running a particularly problematic thing in a VM? Do we concentrate on flat packing all the apps as soon as possible? I mean, do you have a general sense of what would give the most benefit I think flat packing stuff is particularly important, not just because it means that uh, we have the mitigation technologies, but also because it means that we can remove one step of the process in getting security updates into people's hands. Uh, having upstream be able to fix the bug and then make a release and not have to coordinate across multiple distributions before that can be released, I think that's a huge win. So from that perspective, I think that uh, getting applications into a containerized, centrally available form is going to be a really big deal here. Outside that, yeah, the idea of having the PixBuff loaders be basically out of process is a really nice one. I would love to see us in a situation where compromising a loader can do nothing other than give you back a malformed picture. Uh, that sounds like a really, really big win. Okay, so I'm apparently out of time. Uh, so I'll be around the rest of the day, and I'm also here tomorrow. So if anybody would like to talk to me about any of this stuff or have any further questions, then feel free. Thank you.